But today we're going to talk about the connected workplace and OT security. Really, as we kick this off, what is OT security? Like, what do we actually mean when we say that? And then we're going to talk through some business challenges, getting started, why New Volo and Armas, going through several different use cases, and then really just having a conversation about it. Love the clicker. <laughs> All right, so what is operational technology? Really, it's the non-hardened devices. So what do I mean when I say that? They don't, unfortunately, with medical devices, we don't have the luxury of it's been hardened based on best IT practices for years and years and years. We have devices that were essentially manufactured for clinical use, and that's been their focal point. As such, there are certain risks that we ultimately need to take care of. And there's a need for tools out there like Armis that aren't directly hitting the devices. <laughs> okay, so why do we address this? We want to ensure that our environment of care is safe. We want to make sure that our medical devices at the end of the day are available. And then we also want to ensure that our patients are happy. We want the highest age caps and PPQ scores as possible because that ultimately ties into our reimbursement. If a device is ultimately hacked and somebody dies, I'm pretty sure we're going to have bigger concerns than our reimbursement. What are some of the challenges when we think about addressing, again, these medical devices that aren't hardened to the extent of IT devices? Well, first and foremost, a lot of times they're coming from the OEM with certain vulnerabilities or ease of entry into the device. I feel like a lot of people have seen advice with credentials, admin, admin. Okay, so let's change that because anybody that actually knows that device could technically infiltrate your network through that device if those credentials are not modified. Also, you may have an incomplete inventory. I know within this industry, we all have issues with data cleanliness. Well, in addition to that, how often do you have rental pumps coming in after hours that are connected to the network and they're never in your system? You need some sort of a policy or procedure to guide that, and you also need visibility. And that's where really we'll work in conjunction with Armis to better assist you with that. And then lastly, we need the ability to respond to any threats. So there's visibility, which, you'll see with Armis, but then there's also tracking the response. Whether that's going to be through ICE, whether it's gonna be the IT side of the house, potentially partitioning advice from the network, or are you having a technician that already works with a particular patient monitor, they're actually going up and patching the device. The real use cases that we'll be covering today, discovering a lost device, something that ultimately shows up on your inventory from the perspective of Armis, but it wasn't actually in the inventory originally in Nuvolo. Active threat response, when you have an active exploit, how do you manage that? Vulnerability management, unless you're Mayo, um, who has a ton of FTEs, ultimately to take care of some of this, this cyber risk, odds are you're really struggling for resources to get this additional work done. And it's just that. So how do you ultimately prioritize your vulnerabilities so that you have an ease of use hit list? Because at the end of the day, you're not gonna take care of them all. And it, it's critical that everyone understands that. And then lastly, how can we get ahead of this? What kind of a risk assessment process can we do and put in place procedures so that devices are in good shape before they're deployed. And so getting ahead of that, Nuvolo's OT security platform really focuses in on these three different pillars. Risk assessment, so oftentimes that pre-procurement process, whether you're looking at an SBOM, an MDS squared form, being able to understand any of those potential risks before a device is deployed, and then also putting in place the appropriate hardening or controls. 
inventory and workflow and monitoring and response is really where our better together story starts with Armis. It's going to be under better understanding the technical information within the context of your devices in their natural en environment. And then monitoring re and response is really that vulnerability management and then also the active exploit management. So when we start out, again, kind of this discovering a new device, it's really that enrichment process. So our Shah is going to walk us through in a moment some of the information that's coming in through Armis and really what that, that deep packet analysis looks like. It, what we can see here is we've got the transfer of data. You need the technical information now that you didn't necessarily need five, 10 years ago. And we need that in our device record so that we have that complete inventory and there's an understanding of what the technical information is. What's the particular software version you're rocking? What, at times, even the hardware version? Because that's going to determine, to some extent, how far you can go with certain patching and upgrades. And with that, Arshad? Yeah. All right, so, awesome. So, like Dustin said, um, we're going to be working with the whole world, pushing up these device profiles up to the whole so we can complete that massive inventory and, and you know, discovering the risk in your network. So how does our students probably look wondering, right? So number one thing that I want to stop there first is that uh, you're passing agents. And that's what we want in the environment, the health, healthcare environment. Right? You don't want to stay in the device that you normally can't put agents on them because you don't want to dump them off the network. Right, right, right everyone. Shaking their heads, awesome, awesome. Okay, we're on the same page. Cool. So, so that's basically going to be the how, right? So we're going to be passively monitoring. We're going to be passively monitoring the traffic and discovering these devices. Uh, if you want a little bit more detail on exactly how that happens, you know, get a little bit more in the secret sauce. Just stop by our booth and talk about that. Exactly how that discovery happens, but just overall general passively listening to that traffic. So vulnerability management, top challenges. So sheer volume of vulnerabilities with no business risk, prioritization, incomplete and unrebuttable vulnerability data, right? So all of these are pain points of healthcare environments. So what ARM is going to be doing, giving you context of these devices, right? On top of the vulnerabilities. So we're taking everything into consideration, whether it's hardware, firmware, OS version, uh, application versions, they are running on these devices, right? We're going to be taking all that into consideration and giving the vulnerability to list so you can manage these vulnerabilities and prioritize what needs to be priority for your teams and what can kind of get stacked under in the priority. So you guys have a game plan, right? And then again, with Novolo, push it out so you can make those plays. So risk assessment overview. Is there, is there more here? All right, there we go. I'm not going through your slides, am I? You're good. I'll hop back in there. Okay, sure. So, so what you want to make sure is that your devices are properly configured, keep appropriate, you know, security postures on all of these devices. And because Armis is 24/7, continuous monitoring your devices, a security posture is also going to be 24/7, right? And when it gets pushed down into the Volo, it's going to be real time. It's not like a a time and a date that these traditional vulnerability scanners are going to be giving you. So if you miss a scan, oh no, I got to wait until next month or the next scheduled scan. No, this is continuous 24 seven monitoring. So that security posture is going to be real time, continuous. Any, any questions so far? I know I'm talking and rambling a lot. Yeah, of course. Right. So we have the internal set construct on the machine. Sometimes we have to sometimes have the empty there. They contain all PHI.
Is that your question? Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> right. So we wouldn't. So again, the whole part of Armis is that it's passive, right? We're not going out to your devices. We're not. We're not messing with your devices. We're not actively scanning. We're not doing anything. So to for us to go in, to go and uh, sanitize your device, that's us being pretty active, right? Yeah. And that's not what Armis is. Which so basically you are just uh, putting your device at work. Exactly. So now, now it's good that you mentioned PHI because keep that thought. We're going to get into that in a second. Mm -hmm. of how Armist can detect an unencrypted PHI going through your network, right? Okay. Thank you for your question, though. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, use case, but uh, let's move on here. Yeah. You want to grab yeah. this? So risk assessment from our perspective, our process. So our show talked about that continuous monitoring, right? This is where we can try and get to some extent ahead of this. So this is really within our demonstration later on. This is the one element of Nimbolo that I would say is, is largely agnostic of ARMS. And the philosophy behind this is when I'm looking at my MDS swipe form, my SCOM for a particular model, I'm identifying any of the risks before it's actually deployed on the network. And that's why I say this is kind of agnostic because it's that pre work and so as i'm going through that pre-procurement process i'm documenting any of the hardening controls that i need to put in place before that device is released to the web i made the comment earlier about adam and adam and actually modifying that username and password before a device is deployed that's really what our risk assessment tool is all about is documenting any of those findings identifying the corresponding control, and then creating a procedure set that's easy for our boots on the ground technicians. Because another component of this challenge that's just kind of a nightmare is how do we train the skill set? Not every technician is naturally going to be a cybersecurity expert. And so there's times where you may need to leverage the skills of your beam at once and be in a position where they can deploy those controls. And so you may need to create a procedure set that's easier to understand for your everyday technician. So to understand really this workflow, we're creating what are called asset lifecycle checklists. So ultimately, again, understanding what needs to be done at those particular points in the device life cycle. We're assessing the device risk, and then we're lastly applying that appropriate security posture. Again, with changing credentials if necessary, redirecting certain ports, turning ports off. And then, hopefully, when you connect it to the network, Armis doesn't find issues with it. That's the whole point. We're trying to get ahead of it before the continuous monitoring is ultimately needed because there, there's two sides to this. There's what we can do in advance to ensure we're protected, and then there's what we didn't do or where others have identified those, those vulnerabilities and ultimately those threats that need to be taken care of. So just to kind of sum this up, and then we'll get into the product demonstration, Here's our different three pillars of really Ebola. And you can see where Arnis is positioned, where we fit together. Our show is going to show us the platform, and you're going to get a better understanding of that rich technical context that Arnis is providing that we're ultimately going to ingest and then subsequently use for monitoring and vulnerability management. And it's you have to have both sides of there's no way that either of us could really function without the other. Because at the end of the day, when I think about a particular C-arm that may be out there, that C-arm lives in a very specific department. It has its PM history. It has maybe a contract. These are the, the data elements that are ultimately going to be maintained within your bolo, but understanding if there's an active threat against it, or if there's vulnerabilities outstanding against that particular model, that's where Armis is going to step in and ultimately save the day. So it's really that better together story. Can I mention? Yeah. 
So there is it's very clear that the uh, after session one to response. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's supposed to be one more step to be needed because after responding, when it's buried the device, we have to properly restore recovery. Yeah, no, so that, that's a that's a great point. So to your point, after even the, the monitoring and response, oh, there's kind of that recovery process. If yeah. that's what you're leading yeah, to. Exactly. I, I would say when we think about monitoring and response, there's there's a couple of things that need to be understood. First and foremost, there's more work that we can have. Period. It's it's truly that simple. And so a huge portion of this is documentation of the risks that you are uh -huh. accepting mm -hmm. because you can't go through and ultimately fix everything. And so I would say that is to, to a large extent the documentation process in terms of recovery, I think depending on the particular events, you you're gonna have to work that in through your work order. And so much of this space is largely contingent upon, upon your organizational structure. I I was with Interman Healthcare for almost 14 years. And there were certain things, the way we looked at it, anything beyond the wall was IT. Okay. Anything between us and the wall was HDM. It, it was kind of that simple. And in, in regards to the recovery, I would say oftentimes a, a lot of that's going to fall with IT. And so it's how are we document, how are they documenting that with the nurses? If you're on Nebolo, there's a fairly good chance your IT is on ServiceNow's ITSM. And so it would be documented ultimately as a task or an incident on the IT side of the house. So one more thing here, right the second, the human life cycle. It was like the IT device we ran cycle for four to five years. Okay, so the software. But the mental device back back and much more wrong than Yeah. Oh, so how we can do the uh, adjust uh, those things. Yeah, and I, I think it comes down to it again, you start out with that first pillar. Let's do the risk assessment, let's do what we can to get ahead of it. And then with with a tool like Armis, we're catching what we couldn't get ahead of. One solution, you know, demo to understand the process. But the yeah, risk assessment comes with work and um, inventory, or you have to need to have to have an inventory in order to risk assess the situation. Not necessarily. Okay. okay. So let's let's think about this. So free procurement processes. When we think about the devices in our inventory, how many organizations out there have a standard for defense? Okay, probably most of you, especially after the whole PRX debacle. But with that in mind, before you're bringing on a new model, why not understand the issues with it? You can absolutely evaluate a model looking at the MDS squared form and potentially looking at a software bill of materials to understand here's the risk of this model if I bring it into my inventory and don't do any. And that's the risk assessment process. So I would say you absolutely can do it without an inventory. And you should. When you're going through, when supply chain is sitting down evaluating, here's where this particular model should go. When you're performing a was is analysis of what you're going to swap to as far as a net new device. This has to be part of the process. So before recruitment, basically. Yep. But the existing equipment still you have to go through the inventory and that. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So how we can integrate the hospital, most hospital does not have a cybersecurity sophisticated method by cybersecurity policy procedure, how we can do the risk assessment for the step, the how we can associate the hospital procedure. Do you like, have some procedure statement protocol, anything like that? Template. So, yeah, yeah, some sort of template. Call us guys in the back. Call yourself yeah. advisors. Yeah. Uh, no, so it, at the end of the day, so much of this is about education. I always crack I poke fun at Mayo because they have the FTE account. And they've been adequately resourced better than anyone else I know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes down to communication and being able to fight for it. A lot of people are consistently talking about AEM plans 
And then what do you do with those FTEs afterwards? If you're able to optimize your maintenance schedules, this is where you start taking over some of these other responsibilities. And more than anything else, it's about educating your peers. Having somebody show up like Shah or Oscar, like they can help educate your teams on why this matters. And it's got to be bigger than HM. Because even to your point, we were talking about the risk assessment and it can be done before you have the model. Is that going to be a procurement test or is it going to be an HCM test? These are the questions you have to answer. One thing I wanted to add to that, you know, you asked about some resources, definitely NIST has a lot of resources, yeah. right? Especially the cybersecurity framework. I know when you look at it at first hand, you think, well, this is for cybersecurity, it's for IT, it's the response. Look at it, and there's some aspects of it that you can incorporate. But to uh, Dustin's point, you're not going to be able to do it all. You're going to have to partner with your incident response team, but you can at least understand what aspects of it you can adopt. Because at the end of the day, when you're working in incident response and uh, an incident, you need to understand the context of that device, right? You don't want to get the calls. So you know what? Just pull it off the network. That's just not going to so you might be risk assessment, and I think uh, the uh, frame 837 uh, from using the way. What, 837 or 53? I think the 37 is 37. Yeah. yeah. So you can actually leverage that and incorporate it into the technology to actually build a framework. Mm -hmm. But to your earlier question, definitely look at this. If you haven't seen it, there's quite a bit of, of publications. The, the the granddaddy of them all is 853, which you're all familiar with, or you should be. Uh, but I recommend what I call the first notes version of that. It's 800213A. It's specific when you first see it, it says T devices and uh, government and federal agencies. Ignore that, but still go through it, and you'll see that about 80 to 90 percent of those controls are applicable to medical devices as you do a full assessment. So. Go ahead, I want to take more time from the demo there. Okay, and here's the use cases that we're going to go over. Um, again, what it's going to look like when a device is discovered that's ultimately not near your Nebolo inventory. How do we manage that? How does better together story work? What does an active threat look like? How are we ultimately going to respond to it as the healthcare technology management? How are we going to look? And vulnerability management. Again, more workload than we can actually take care of. So, how do we rescore that as necessary? How does this all tie back into the CDE? And then, lastly, again, that risk assessment process. What can we do to get in front of this before the device is actually connected and potentially having risks? All right. Well, let's get started then. Well, I tried the double finger thing. I didn't. It's all right. That's better. Everyone sees this? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so, um, so how are we discovering these lost devices? Again, uh, we can't put an agent on them. You can't actively scan them. So it's going to be passive monitoring. Well, it's going to be through tap, span. Um, getting it from different data sources, right? We're going to be discovering these different devices that you wouldn't have in your traditional inventory list. Now, whether it's uh, me sitting in the Air Force and going through my Excel document, <clears throat> or, <laughs> or uh, you're going through manually and plugging it into, you know, different, different solutions. So what ARM is going to do is discover them through passive monitoring of your traffic. And then this is what your inventory is going to look like. Now, again, this is a... Uh, demo environment, it's not limited to what Armis can discover, but um, this is where everything would sit. Now, notice that it's not just medical devices. This is going to be everything on your network. Now, whether it's a smart TV, it's an HVAC system, uh, smart car parking in and plugging into your, you know, connecting to your Wi-Fi network, all of that's going to be discovered here um, for you. Now, this is a nice card mode view of it looks pretty but you can't really do much with it unless you can dive deeper into it which is exactly what we're going to do right now so let's go and do that so let's just say i want to look at a ct all my ct machines 
So now this is all the list of your CT machines that we discovered, right? Come over here, click into one of them. Now there's a deep dive view and device profile of that CT machine. So notice that the only data source is going to be that traffic inspection. There's no other way of finding this device out. There's no agent that we can call back from, right? So with just that traffic inspection, you see what this device is, the model, the manufacturer of this device, IP, Mac, all that good stuff, on top of the hardware, firmware, OS, and firmware version right here. Now, on top of that, we also are going to be telling you what applications are running on this device. And if known, the application version. Now, why is the application version important? Great, fantastic, whoever said that. So there's vulnerabilities associated to versions of applications, right, right, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna tie that back in here later on. So on top of hardware, firmware, OS version, application version, what can we do with all that information? Why is that relevant? Why do we wanna know? I just said it right now, it's a vulnerability list, right? And then the risk factors that are associated to that. So if you see here, Armis is providing you risk factors of everything that we're seeing. Now, again, remember, we're listening to the traffic. So if you go to the activities tab, you can see how this device is communicating, what it's communicating with, what ports, what protocol is utilizing. Taking all that into consideration, we know what this device should be doing, how it should be communicating in your environment. So if there's any anomalous, nefarious behavior, PHI, unencrypted PHI communicating over, right, right, right? So we're gonna be showing alerts on that. Now this alert here is going to be specifically for some threats that we've seen on your network. So these alerts are going to be ransomware communication detected, wanna cry kill switch communication detected. And if you hit that carrot here, you can see how, what activities resulted in that, right? Right here, connected to a specific domain, what devices were affected by it. And if you click into that threat, you can see a description of that threat, what that threat is, and you can even take action utilizing your, like Dustin said, uh, your uh, Cisco ICE and, and firewalls to enforce on these devices, right? Now, taking all that information, we're giving you a complete device profile of what this device is, how it's communicating on your network. And now what we can do, Novolo, to complete your inventory is push it out. So we integrate with Novolo, we push it out, we create these devices and profiles and the uh, vulnerabilities and threats, exploits seen there and then Novolo can grab that, yes, and create a workflow. Yeah, fields, and then Novolo, uh, database. <laughs> uh, all of it, not yet, it, it, in all transparency. And so it's, it's important to think through who sits where, okay? And it, what I mean when I say that is you're going to have certain users that are frequently logging into ARMS, you're going to have certain users that are frequently logging into the mobile. And then you're going to have this small kind of subset that's really looking at both. At the end of the day, when it comes down to some of the technical information, a lot of times, like, you're basically your software version and your operating system, that may be enough for a good portion of your techs. And that those are going to be the critical elements, really the, the Mac and IP addresses, will be tied in on the Nicola record. And that information is really that, that baseline that most of your text, that's maybe all they need. You know, but then you also have those super users that are going to need to take it one step further. And even as our shot alluded to, there's going to be certain work that's performed by IT. A good portion of the time, that's not us. And so how do we transition that information, whether it is leveraging a tool that's going to talk to Cisco Ice, ultimately kind of start that ACL process or the changes that's necessary, that's, that's one option. If it requires actual IT boots on the ground, to my definition earlier, if it's beyond the wall, then maybe we need to issue an answer. And a lot of times that's going to be facilitated really through harness rather than new wall. You know what I mean? Uh, 
Um, that Marcus has discovered, and you can go forward addressing it over time. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer on behalf of the and then I'll hopefully turn it over. But it depends on the level of granularity. If if you want more of an overhead view and you want to understand the progress of the workers that are being pushed to HCM, I suggest you use Nicola's report. If you want it to be more granular, yeah, so if it's if it's not as granular as you know Nivola need to take care of it or you want to get more granular into it, then uh, Armist does have a reporting feature. Actually, I'm going to get into that in a second on the dashboards and, and what you can do with all this information that I'm showing you in a moment here just to tie it all up. But yes, to answer your question, anything that you see here can be reported out to an organizational box, individual emails, um, or even dashboards, which I'm going to show you right now. Last device I wanted to show you, and this is going to be, you know, kind of where I pass it on to Dustin so you can get into Novolo here, is another device, X-ray machine, right, where we've integrated with Novolo and we pushed out this device profile into Novolo. Right, now this device, again, same stuff, hardware, firmware, uh, information, OS information, application information, you see the vulnerabilities again that are associated to this device, specific Java that is running on it that is uh, vulnerable. But if you notice the alert here, you can see that there is an unencrypted PHI transmission to external destination, right? Again, you drop it down, you can see what devices were affected by this or were involved here. And then you can click into that exploit and give you a quick description of what that is. And again, same thing, what devices were affected, what activities caused that alert to populate. Now we push this device profile and this exploit out associated to that device to Nivolo. And Nivolo is going to pick it up. It's going to create a workflow and create these in, these uh, these exploits in this device into its profile. And Dustin's going to show you exactly how that's going to look on the Nivolo side in a second. So lastly, to go back to your question about alerts um, and, and reporting, everything that you saw there can be pulled into a dashboard and an alert. So if we come over here, you can query, query all that information and all of these are customizable. Actually, a matter of fact, I think you saw me do this where I was creating these dashboards from scratch because I created a new new, uh, new user. So when you log in, you don't have any dashboards. So your teams can create dashboards based on what they care about and what they want to see. And you don't need to run those queries again. It's not like you have to go in there, ah, every month I need to click this button to, to see what I have. No, this is continuous, constantly pulling information of what you have on your network. If you want to do a vulnerability dashboard, if you want to do a how many CTs and what models I have on my network, boom, it's right there for you that you can create and query. And the queries are very easy. You have a lot of out of the box queries that you can pull from that we've seen all of our customers use. Or if you want to create one that is a very specific use case, don't worry, we can help you out. We're not going to just leave you high and dry. <laughs> All right, so any any questions here before I pass on to Dustin on what I've showed you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, a lot of hospitals usually, let's say, they have a monitoring system. The monitoring system is on separate networks, usually. Okay. So, technically, how you monitor the activities of those monitoring networks, the network that basically the monitoring, uh, the special monitoring system is working. So, because they are not in a hospital network, so you have to some more, but they are in an imagery, mm -hmm. actually in imagery. How you how you can risk assess those devices? So you're saying that the device is not communicating on your network at all? No, they are separate network. Okay, so uh, they're a completely not, separate network being managed by different third party organizations. They are somehow connected to the hospital network through the HSM and whatever. But how do you technically how you can monitor? Yeah. So there are, there are different solutions that we can go about this, right? There are different architectures that a lot of organizations have. So there's different deployment models that we can go through, right? Now, whether it's going to be a virtual collector where we can deploy an ER span that traffic in, whether it's going to be a hardware collector that we're going to be deploying an additional one, maybe a smaller one, because maybe that network is not going to be as big, right? So it's separate, but it's not that big. So it'll be a smaller collector that we can deploy. So there's a lot of different deployment models that we would just consult with you and, and come up together. Uh, but but we really need to see that traffic, right? If you want to monitor 
if you want to monitor that device, the specific device you're talking about, we're going to need to see that traffic. It's just, just the reality of it. It's not a magic. It's not a magic show. <laughs> yes. Question in regard to uh, some of our MRIs have a VPN access. Will you be monitoring that if it's an open line or we have the remote uh, just on um, the control panel? So that communication that's going in and out, you'll be really, really monitoring that. If the traffic is coming in, going out, yes, we can see that. And uh, you'll see that a threat and shut it off. I mean, well, no, 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 no. So, so you, okay. Why would it be a threat? Well, I mean, is there trying to access equipment to download logs and files that sometimes might have to information? So we wouldn't be shutting it off unless there's a policy that you're setting up within a third-party solution, such as NAC, to do that. If you're going to be kicking it off to a separate VLAN, kicking it off your network. You can set up those policies. We'll be creating those groups. Armas will be help creating those groups within your, let's go say, theoretically, you're using Cisco ICE, right? Cisco ICE is very hard to bring off the ground. What Armas can do is create those group and profile devices for your Cisco ICE and help you actually implement Cisco ICE. Now, in doing so, right, we're creating those groups already. You just need to go in there and say, once I get this, alert from Armis or this policy from Armis, what to do. And then from Cisco Ice, you can configure it to do whatever you need, whether it's to kick it off the network, like I said, kick it into a different VLAN, whatever you want to do. So that's just dependent on what you're trying to do on the enforcement side. Armis doesn't do any enforcement of its own. Again, passive, that's a bread and butter. We don't want to, we don't want to mess with that. But we integrate with third party solutions to enforce, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. So even if we out of the box detect that it's a threat, you can customize and say, no, I accept it. This is normal behavior. Go ahead and suppress yeah, it. Exactly. Exactly. You always have that ability to customize it. Yeah, because we have permission for a vendor to do remote diagnostics. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they look at it. Yeah. And that will be covered depending on a breakage or. Sure. Uh, but you yep. know who those vendors are and how yep. the normal traffic works. So you would create an alert to um, reflect that. So if they do anything out of baseline that's mm -hmm. anomalous, out of character for them. I can just can show you exactly what he means by that by going back to that threat. And then I'm going to pass it on over to Dustin because he needs to do his thing, right? So let's just say this alert specifically is what you're talking about. Yeah. Armis alerted on that. You can come over here and whitelist that device that's coming in. You can change the policy to not alert you on it. You can suppress that alert to say that you're accepting it. And you can even go in there and determine why you're suppressing it whether it's an accepted risk, whether it's something that we don't need to be bothered by it. So you just get to determine why you're suppressing it as well. And it actually will show up there to why that is. So if somebody else is doing it, it's not you, you can go back and review and see why that alert was suppressed. Earlier, you showed an extraction of a piece of equipment, extra equipment, where you showed all the, the operating system and all. Mm -hmm. How do you gather that data? Through traffic the traffic and different data sources that we're pulling from. So now the different data sources are gonna be integrations that we have, but that's gonna be more on the traditional you know, IT side. But for medical devices, you don't have agents on it, we can't pull from that. So it's gonna be through the traffic that we're monitoring. And if we know these traffic behaviors, we know these packets, we're only looking at the header, we're pulling the metadata, sending it up to our cloud where a knowledge base is sitting. A knowledge base is a very simplified version, so we don't get super detailed, into, you know, down into the mud and, uh, but it's where our AI ML technology is sitting and where we would baseline all this traffic behavior. So we know what these devices are, what operating systems they have, what model, what manufacturer they belong to. So therefore we can show it here on your inventory side. Yeah, and protocol analyzers, right? Exactly. All, all these devices within different versions have a certain figure or pattern of how they communicate even within something like a windows a windows 7 system with a certain patch revision has a specific type of signature so, mm -hmm. so taking that and putting it in our knowledge base in the cloud we can deduce hey this is a windows 7 but only service pack one as we saw the type of traffic is to generate and you have a process to capture the remote radiologists that have their workstations at home and remote conferences and things like that so that would need to call back home right again we need to see that traffic so as long as we see the traffic, yes. <laughs> if we don't see the traffic, are you, is there a way that you're, is it calling home somewhere? Is there a third party solution that you're, that those remote 
devices are coming back into that are being uh, tracked. Well, if we see the traffic, then yes. Yes, we can. All right, well, I think I took all the time here, so. <laughs> you're, you're okay, I'm sorry, good. All right, so we've seen the RMS side of it. So now we're gonna hop into the connected workplace and better understand how this will tie in to our device records, look at a particular security event, and then lastly, well, vulnerability management, and then lastly, we'll look at one of these risk assessments. Okay, so we wanted to start out with a, a lost device. And we saw Somatom earlier. So what this would look like within Nuvolo, I've got my Somatom right here. It's, it's basically a shell right now because this was a device that was discovered by Armis, but it wasn't in our inventory. And so automatically I've got a device verification work order. And this is going to allow us to put our boots on the ground to ultimately go figure out what this device is. Upon understanding really what this device is, then I could either go ahead and put this to an in-stock status. I'm going to ultimately start defining who owns it, what location is it in, give it an actual manufacturer, and start aligning it really to the other somatomes in our system. And so when you think about that complete inventory, that's what it, what's going to get you through your audits. I mean, right now, as it stands today, when Joint Commission shows up, they're not asking you to open Armis, they're asking you to open Nivolo. And so you want that to be your complete system of, of truth, whether or not that changes in the near term because Joint Commission is starting to look at certain cybersecurity elements. So just wait for the new EPs, everybody. So that's for a newly discovered device, okay? Well, let's talk about a device that's already in your inventory and then look at what's going to happen with anomalous <laughs> behavior. So that active exploit, an active security event. If we're thinking about beyond the wall, right, we need to understand what's going on and then take the appropriate steps as necessary. So here, this is the information as it's defined directly in Armis. I don't know if everybody saw it on the screen, but there were specific remediation steps. If healthcare technology management needs to take care of any of these steps, this is where when the anomalous behavior comes through, it's identified against a specific device in your inventory. In this case, it was our mini C arm. And I've got work orders that I can push out to individuals that are already working on that device. Dustin already has a relationship with radiology, okay? And so Dustin needs to be the one to ultimately go respond to that work order because of that relationship. You don't want to end up in a situation where you're alienating or jeopardizing your relationship with your clinicians simply because you need a cybersecurity expert. Use the resources you already have. If you have a great imaging tech that knows this device, have the imaging tech go take care of it. Give them an understanding of what needs to be done instead of overcomplicating it. Again, the biggest issue we're facing here is we have to do more with less. So let's make sure that everybody is best enabled as they can be. And then to think through, again, this better together story, the information that Nuvolo is leveraging from Armis is largely our technical information. So what's our operating system? What's the software version? When was this first discovered? When was it most recently discovered? What is our IP address if it's on DHCP? 
this can change. So we're able to take in that information, but let's not forget who owns it. Where is it at as far as physical location? The stuff that your HTM techs are already putting in. So it's the, not only is it the most complete inventory in the sense that if we have devices that were identified by Armis and not in the network, now we're going to validate that they are what they are, but we're also pulling in that operational context that Armis really isn't going to be able to get simply because that's the information our technicians have put in. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yeah, we're, I don't, we don't have control over it. Uh huh. Um, I'm looking to see does it indicate whether the device was connected to Armis? That I mean, that's a great question. We're gonna see it right here. So our discovery source is Armis, and when was it first discovered? When was it most recently discovered? When did we find that network traffic? And that's ultimately, it's going to load in here, it's gonna update. And so you can know when this was last seen. If this is an infusion pump and that date's like two, three weeks old, you, you probably have a problem. <laughs> like where the hell did it go? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, this, this is automated, yeah. Because in almost everything, really, this tab is automated. The one element that I strongly encourage everybody to be thinking about as you're going through your cybersecurity journey, put in your MAC address. Start that work today. There needs to be a tie out. I mean, serial numbers, if it's, if it's in the packet, they're gonna catch it, largely. But unfortunately, not all serial numbers are in the packet. So you do need to do some, some level of manual work to ensure that we have that match in the beginning. Even yesterday, I was, I was talking to someone at our booth and it was, he was talking about potentially getting Nuvola and Armis and which order to deploy them. I really, I don't care which order you deploy them. The one thing I say is start collecting your MAC addresses. Do it in your old system right now. Because without that, without that high fidelity tie, you want to have the most complete and robust inventory you can have. But at the same time, you don't want a ton of verification work orders kicking out simply because you've got a mismatch of information. You'd piss off a lot of technicians if you did that. <laughs> so. Question. Yes. For both of you. Um, so could Novolo, that technical task, mm -hmm. could that get information from a different uh, acid scanning platform that's integrated with Novolo? Mm -hmm. And then similarly, can Armis, could you just get Armis by itself and then have that integrated with a different CMMS? Both, then, both questions, yes. Uh, yeah. Both questions. We, we're leveraging our relationship, but I mean, we've got other friends here as well. Like there's, and they're gonna be the exact same way. If you need an integration with your CMMS, which anybody that has a passive monitoring tool, you should. <laughs> um, but there's, there's gonna be other tools that Armis works with and there's other tools that we work with as well. And when you think about larger IDNs, right? Unfortunately, you have certain IDNs that have multiple CMMSs, and you have certain organizations that have multiple passive monitoring solutions. And so at the end of the day, either of our organizations, we're gonna do what we can to best work with our clients, which at times means integrating with other tools as well. Hey, can I have a question? Mm -hmm. So for example, the uh, Facebook, already registered CMMS already, but yeah, absolutely. Going back to our example of a of a lost device or a, a newly discovered device, uh -huh. that somatone, it was just that. 
-hmm. It wasn't actually in Nuvolo, but mm -hmm. Armis saw it. And so it puts in a shell of a device into Nuvolo uh -huh. and kicks off that pending verification work order uh -huh. so that we can put boots on the ground to assess what it is. And so it, it is that signal, but it's important that we kind of think strategically about this. I know one of the areas that would give me pause is we did a lot of overnight pump rentals. Uh -huh. And they oftentimes weren't checked in by healthcare technology management, and they're still going to get connected to the, the network and leveraged as needed as it's an overnight rental. But that was never in our system. And so Armis would catch that, and I need to have a business process or policy in place to kind of handle that so that I'm not every morning sending a tech to go hunt for these rentals. So there, there's this, you have to be very, very strategic as you're thinking through how you want to operationalize all this information. And sometimes it, it may be worthwhile to hire a consultant. I mean, there's organizations that truly focus on this and this is their bread and butter and they're helping organizations stand these programs up because it's, it's going to be a challenge to get the resources you need. And I hate to say it, I know I dealt with this a lot, but consultants get paid well to be heard. And if you're not able to get traction with your executive leadership, it may be worth paying somebody lots of dollars to get the resourcing that you actually need. I'm just throwing it out. All right, so that was an active security event. Now when we think through how we manage vulnerabilities, right? So there's a ton of work that needs to be performed and unfortunately, we're not able to take care of all of it. So what we need to do is start really making that hit list. So when we're getting information that's tied back to a particular CVE, we're also going to have our corresponding vulnerability score. Within the context of your environment, there may be elements that are different. So you may want to go through and actually rescore a device within the CVSS framework. Nuvolo gives you the ability to do that. So we're starting with that information that came over from Armis that's tied to the National Vulnerability Database to have our common vulnerability enumeration. But if I need to adapt this because my environment is unique, I can do that as needed. And once we have that composite score, this is where I'm starting to ultimately prioritize what, what's on my hit list. What do I need to focus on in order to ensure that our environment is safe. And then once I've determined that, I can either push my work orders or I can defer these. I can start ultimately taking that action to better understand what needs to be done or do I let this slide? So the last area of focus is going to be that proactive component. So far, we've talked about how we can work with Armis after your devices are deployed and ensure that your environments are protected and safe. How do we get ahead of it? And that's where our risk assessment process really comes into play. I can perform risk assessments either pre-purchase or after purchase. So after with my existing inventory. So you've got both. It's, it can be an evaluation before you're adding new models to your environment, or it's understanding exactly what needs to be done with your existing environment. Once you've identified your make and model, and then also any of the risks that are out there. So this is the information you're finding in your MDS squared form. 
okay? Reading through the way this is going to be used within your environment and understanding any of the risks that it may bring into your environment and having a corresponding control is really the foundation to this. Once you've established that here's my potential problems, here's what I can do with it, then you're going to have a risk reduction score. And this is where you start thinking about how you're going to deploy any of these con controls or configurations. This is done by setting up our tasks and then also establishing a procedure that's easy. Okay, why is this so important? You don't need to be an expert to put these controls in place. A technician needs to understand as part of their asset onboarding process, when they're performing their functional tests as a device is deployed, what controls also need to be put in place? Because then when it does finally start transmitting information on the network and Armis sees this device, hopefully it, it's not at risk at that point because you've already deployed the controls that helps you get away from vulnerabilities and active threats. So once there's that understanding of what tasks need to be done, then it's associating your devices, creating that security lifecycle profile, and issuing the work orders out to the individuals that already touch those devices. Let's not reinvent the wheel. When you went through a Nuvolo deployment, you established specific rules regarding your assignment, and those should be the individuals working on the same work orders. And then, of course, tracking all of this through. So ensuring that we are adequately hardening these devices before deployment into the wild, and then also having an understanding of any changes that are made to our risk assessment throughout the life of the risk assessment process. And that's really our, our demonstration. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions. I think everybody's been pretty active during it, but anything specific? One quick thing, Justin, I'd like to add. We talked about risk assessment. Remember, it's a point in time. As things change, the threat landscape, we go back and make changes. So, for example, if as part of the pre procurement process, the devices in question are only going to be a handful, five of them, specific use case for a specific location. So, that's something you factor into your risk assessment. But lo and behold, fast forward 12 months from now, through acquisition or whatever. Now you've quadrupled the number of devices and you're spread across your healthcare system. Guess what? Now your exposure is a lot greater, so it's going to impact the risk. So you can go back and start making those tweaks. Because understand, we focus quite a bit, bit on CBEs. That's just one component, one thing to focus on to establish risk. What about FDA recalls? What about uh, out of date operating systems? You know, we touched on it quickly around putting controls, right? They're preventive controls. Prevent, well, you're not going to prevent an outdated system. The only way to deal with it is to actually replace it because of other factors, costs, you know, budget, that may not be an option. Then you have to explore mitigating controls. Do I put a firewall? Do I limit its use? What else can they do to mitigate that risk, right? So there are other options. We always tend to go to preventative or remediation where I just patch it and I'm done. We, we're not always afforded that lecture. So now you start getting into risk management. And that's where, you know, what Dustin was showing can help you do is, okay, it started with a handful of devices, it's quadrupled, I need to go back and reassess the risk and present that up to the organization so they understand what you signed up for. Because what you don't want is to come back and say, hey, 12 months ago you said this was low risk. Just, yeah, but you were talking about five devices. Now, it's all over the network. It's increased quite significantly. Now we've introduced more risk into the organization. It is possible to send about something to your portion that we can put a human process in the makeup of the machine before rolling up our network. 
to clean, but it has been kept for like say, in the past separate network to make sure that we are no vulnerable to the whole network. I, so, so you can do that. I mean, you can connect it to a separate VLAN, let's just say, uh -huh. and then send that VLAN to us. We discover it, give you a security posture on that device, okay. monitor it, uh -huh. and then if it's all good, you can introduce it back into, back into your environment. So that's that's fun way of going about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're sure. <laughs> um, so this the risk score is based on, you know, we're about to buy these devices, mm -hmm. whatever. This is operating system, CVDs, whatever we're analyzing here. Can we compare that to devices that we already have that we would be replacing? <laughs> Ah, that, that's a good question. So being able to kind of measure the risk score and even the residual risk score of a particular model and then comparing it to a different model. Yeah, so like we're getting yep. this Philips monitor. We, yep. have, we have a different Philips monitor. Is it actually beneficial for us to, up, to replace it or can we just keep what we have right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of where we're at right now, it would be manual to compare those two scores. Um, but that's great feedback that I'll pass on to our product team. Yeah. I was guessing that you guys have some customers who are, who are on this partnership. Mm -hmm. and they have some solutions um, like people are there, get this about like a kind of foundation of baseline programs in place for like to get a to get a department started. Let's say you have no cybersecurity process. Actually or just you guys have some like cookie cutter yeah, so I, I would say our risk assessment platform is is really plug and play and then even our integration, if once it's set up, it's pretty straightforward. Where you're gonna face difficulty is the resourcing and then your business process. And that's where I like I had alluded to First Health Advisors before. Um, I think they offer a really good consulting engagement to help groups stand up their cybersecurity team because the tools for all intensive purposes, I think what Arshad and I did today, this is the easy part, right? It's getting the business process and the resourcing to be successful. I would say that's that's the bigger challenge because nobody's that's getting right. FTEs right now. And so I realized that's a long-winded response and I didn't give you anything like cut and dry, but I, I truly believe that's kind of where we're at. Add on to that, Justin, Armas is, like you said, plug and play, right? So if you have a brand new cybersecurity uh, team and you have no idea what risks you have, what vulnerabilities, what threats, even don't have a complete inventory, Armas is your player, right? You plug it in, it's already pre configured box, you don't need to do anything with it. You just need to talk to a networking team to get that traffic into us, and it'll let the technology do the work. So it's an edge appliance or? So again, span tap, uh, again, it's any way to see the traffic. And integrations too. Integrations as well, data sources. But if we're talking strictly medical device, then you want to look at the traffic. My question is, I, I, I'm not quite sure how the, you would handle the, for example, a PLV call. Mm -hmm. you, you can block them, the devices, what, what you can do. Is it the first you know, you can, if any way that you're passing the whole system to, for example, user knows about it, or the guys to, like, I mean, are you about it? How do you manage this situation? So, our, so the ARMA side, I think I answered that. So, the okay. ARMA side, we're going to tell you what FDA recalls are for each of us. You can even set up reports and, uh, Dashboards to tell you what FDA vehicles there are, what device you are supposed to be monitoring the GFDA yes. website, you, you know before. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So we're letting you know. And then on that, the Volo side, we push it on all the Volo mail, hey, these, these devices that are FDA recalls on them. Okay. 
Yeah, correct. I, yeah, no, you're you're spot on. The only element I would add to it is Armis is only going to catch those devices that are not connected, right? And so that's where there's still a need for the manual intervention. And within the context of Nuvolo, when we're when you create a recall, it's simply filtering what information, so which devices need that recall. And this has been really helpful if you, even if you didn't have Armis, like the Alaris pump, if I'm rocking 9.33.2 and I have that in the technical information, then I can focus anytime there's alerts only tied to that. And I'll have that, the ability to create that manual. It's a lot simpler on the network connected devices because then Armis is pushing it to us. If it will show up the type of the uh, USS database, and then whenever the, uh, the re implementing the, uh, the some solution it and then break it down, right? 